All right. Okay, so uh, the reason I love peripheral nerves is because this is the low-hanging fruit. This is the stuff that without anybody's wonderful discoveries wants to grow. Schwann cells, as we just heard about, Schwann cells are this wonderful cell that wants to draw axons in. As soon as a peripheral nerve is cut, those Schwann cells, they start multiplying, they line up, and they start throwing out breadcrumbs. They want those axons to come down. The axons begin to sniff those things out, and they start heading down towards the target. They, this environment was set up to regrow, so when you have an injury in the limb, that, that you will recover after time. And the, the issue in the peripheral nervous system is what I tell patients is the train tracks. The train is the axon, the tracks are the nerve itself, the conduit for those axons to grow down. And as long as I can put a reasonable train track back together, in a reasonable amount of time, those axons will make their way to a target. So here we go. So um, some of the issues with, with nerve injuries are it's awfully hard to tell which ones are gonna recover and which ones aren't. And so here's, here's a picture of a nerve median nerve in the arm, MRI looked fine, everything else, but you get down, you open the arm up and you squeeze on this thing and it's rock hard and you cut it open and it's completely filled with scar tissue. So a little bit like the glial scar in the spinal cord, you can have scar tissue within the peripheral nerve, those axons, they can't make their way across it on the other end. And we can be a little bit more macro in our approach to this, we cut the scar stuff out, so we rebuild our train tracks, cut that out, and we gotta find a bridge to put in its place. And that's a nerve we pull from somewhere else. So your spare parts. So in the peripheral nervous system, we look for areas where you can tolerate having that nerve removed. So getting numb spot in the side of the foot, people could tolerate that pretty well. It starts out a good area and it shrinks up to about a quarter size in a few years, but we have this nice long, an adult's 30 centimeter piece of noodle that we can go back there and build our bridge with. And so that's how that works. This is an arm that was lacerated. The, the nerve that flexes the arm is here, the nerve that goes to the hand, the median nerve that closes that is there, and then there's a sensory nerve that runs next to it. So we took that sensory nerve, and we trim these guys back, and we rebuild them. Now, the thing to consider here is, <clears throat> the, the closer the target is, the better they do, the simpler the function is, the better they do. So this nerve to the biceps, to flex the arm is gonna be great. It's right nearby, one function. The median nerve one, you've got a lot of different functions going in. You've got turn of the palm down, flexing the wrist, flexing the fingers, sensation of the palm, sensation of the fingers, this sort of thing. And so you're asking a lot of nature for the right axons to end in the right place and to get good function, but it works okay as long as you get on top of it early. So here's the basic, the obstacles to successful re of the peripheral nervous system, time, distance, complexity, and age. And this applies to the, the spinal cord as well, but the younger they are, the better they do. The simpler the nerve is, the better it does, and the closer it is to the target, and the quicker you can get on it, the more likely you are to get a good result. So I won't get into the details, but there's things taking place at every level that, that interfere with this. The muscle itself degenerates, the cell bodies, they don't regenerate as fast. Some of them actually die off when you have the nerve injury, the distal nerve scars, and then getting nerves across these repair sites, you'll lose a set of them each time they jump one of your repairs. And so there are a lot of things working against us to get a good result. So here's the traditional way, we're still on nerves now, brachial plexus injury. Motorcycle accidents, the majority of my business here, you fall off and rip the shoulder away from the neck and, and you rip up the brachial plexus. So these are the nerves, the spine would be right here, the nerve roots, and then this is the area that gets torn up. And so the previous strategy, which is many people's strategy in the spinal cord was, let's recreate the brachial plexus the way God made it. Let's go get a bunch of noodles from all over the body, both feet, both arms, and lay this stuff in here until we can recreate what this thing looked like and hopefully it'll all grow back. Now you gotta realize, again, you have sensory, motor, agonist, antagonist, your biceps, and your triceps. All these things are coming out of here and you've got a long distance from up here on the side of his neck down to these muscles here for these to grow, and then a lot of faith that they're gonna land on the right target, which again applies to the spinal cord. And so the results in these types of repairs is eh, mediocre. He took his frown out of here, but there's his arm three years later. He can flex at the elbow again, his shoulder's back in the socket. He doesn't have much below that, and it's, a, it's an assisting arm. He can maybe drape some things over it, and you know the pain will be better, but for the most part, this is not a fantastic result, as you can imagine. And then we run into the problem with this. What about nerve root avulsion? When we had these injuries, you pull the shoulder away from the neck. Sometimes instead of just ripping those nerves in half outside of the neck, sometimes you actually pop the nerve out of the spinal cord. So when you pop the nerve out of the spinal cord, what are you gonna graft? And if that corresponds the, uh, to flexing the elbow, if you wanna get your elbow to flex, the initial concern was, well, we have nothing to do that. 
And then we got into what's called nerve transfers. So now we're going to start moving towards what applies to spinal cord injury. But nerve transfers is the idea that you can take a nerve which originally performed one completely different function and rewire that into a brand new muscle. So this a fellow named Christophe Oberlin, who's an uh, orthopedic surgeon in France, um, introduced this nerve transfer, which takes into consideration all the issues we talked about before, the distance, the simplicity, uh, single, single function, and so forth. And he developed a nerve transfer, which really sort of revolutionized the way we approach brachial plexus injury. The idea was that you can take, when you have an upper plexus, this means your shoulder's paralyzed, your biceps is paralyzed, sometimes your triceps is paralyzed, but your hand works beautifully. You've got two important motor nerves running to the hand, and we know that the nervous system has redundancy to it. We've got a little bit more than we need for everything we do. There's more accents than you actually need to, to run each of the muscles and so forth. Well, if you peel that nerve apart, that motor one that's going to the hand, and take a fascicle of it, nerves are a bundle of subnerves or fascicles inside. You can open up that sheath on the outside, the epineurium it's called, and peel out a piece. And you plug that right into the biceps there, and then you've got pure motor. You've got about three centimeters regeneration. And that obeys all the things we talked about. And one other concept for you, the plasticity in the peripheral nervous system, like the central, is, is the motor unit. Um, and you can enlarge, so the amount of fibers, muscle fibers that a single motor neuron innervates is the motor unit. You can cut out up to four-fifths of the axons, and the remaining one-fifth will stretch out and grab more muscle fibers. So you don't even have to actually match the right number of axons to recover the muscle. But that's the idea. So here's an example. Can you play that video for me? Just run down to the little triangle on the lower left and click it. There you go. So this guy had a bad motorcycle accident. <clears throat> and his shoulder was out, and he had no biceps, and that's no good. There we go. All right, so no deltoid, no biceps, no wrist, no finger extension. He's ripped up a bunch of nerves in his arm. All right, you can click on or but you get the idea. His arm is paralyzed. So we went in and did some of these procedures. So this is that nerve transfer we talked about. Here's the biceps. Here's the median nerve, the ulnar nerve, and the nerve to the biceps comes off right here. That's a sensory nerve to the forearm. The nerve to the brachialis muscle, which lies right underneath the biceps, is right there. We take these two nerves apart, pick a piece for each, and uh, if you want to click on that, I'll show you how we do it. Run down and find our little triangle again. So I've opened up the nerve, and we find the little sub-pieces of it, and we zap them, and we see, okay, that's, that's intrinsic to the hand. We want to stay away from that wrist flexion. We've got all kinds of muscles and nerves run wrist flexion, so we'll steal from that, and then we'll move on, and that's our hookup. And then here he is three months afterwards. Play that one, if you would. So three months, he's beginning to get that thing to work. Rah. And then two years, he's going to show off for us here, if you can find that one and make it play. So we did several hookups. We did that one I showed you for the biceps. We did a lower subscapular to his triceps. His deltoid actually spontaneously recovered, and we did some tendon transfers for his wrist. We were able to make an arm that is essentially normal. So I love iPhones nowadays because I was able to call this guy up and say, hey, can you take a picture of yourself and zip it to me on your iPhone? And so here he is. He has nerves running from his hand to his biceps now. And, and he has no trouble curling small weights. And it looks like a relatively normal bicep. It has none of the normal input from the bicep. These are all nerves that originally went to the hands that are now wired into the biceps to run it. So that's the idea. You can take nerves that have a completely different original destination. You can wire them into something else. You can cut down on time, and the brain can figure this stuff out. And so here was our traditional grafting. The guy on the left 
with his wimpy little biceps. Here's a bunch of guys that had the, the nerve transfers I talked about, and they have very normal looking biceps, good functional arms. <clears throat> Therapy is really important here. You want to be able to conceptualize where it came from. So, oops. So you can take a patient, we can run it from the chest muscle into the biceps, and you want them to learn how to contract the chest muscle. On the good side, contract the chest muscle and the biceps together. Once you get that concept down, then you move it over to the bad side. And originally, or when it first starts recovering, they're trying to move the chest, and up comes the arm. Or with the, or with the one we just did, we have them squeeze a ball or something, they squeeze the ball, and up comes the bicep. Some of them don't even notice that phase, and they just recover, and it works spontaneously. But for most folks, it's good to have some rehab to really learn how to recruit that new muscle because you have a new wiring pattern. All right, so when we work down <clears throat> below the elbow, we have even more discrete functions. We can separate nerves out to even the different sensation, the different web spaces of the hand, the feet eminence of the thumb, the different flexors, extensors. There's all kinds of stuff in there we, we can rewire, and it comes from every level of the spinal cord. So the fella got shot through the arm, and his radial nerve went out. It was just too long a segment. We would have lost his triceps by trying to graft that. And so we were able to go into his forearm, pick some branches of the median nerve that we thought I could do without, find the radial nerve that he was missing, do a little connection like this. We painted him green and pink for you, so you see what we did. And this one's a little tougher to go ahead and run that video. This one's a little tougher to conceptualize because you're having flexion go to extension and finger flexion go to finger extension. So there's a lot of co-contraction done in, in physical therapy. But he has... He has individual movement extension of each of the fingers and the thumb and wrist extension. And he has essentially a normal hand running off completely different nerves once again. If you put them right next to each other, this hand, the right hand, doesn't come up quite as far as the other. It's not quite as coordinated, but it's a heck of a lot better than anything we've got with tendon transfers in the past. So just another video of the same thing. Comparing tendon transfers and nerve transfers, the tendon transfer radially deviates. You can't really get the wrist and fingers all the way back with this one. With the nerve transfer, you have essentially a normal hand. So then it was time to, why aren't we applying this to spinal cord injury? So we went and looked up and see, see what had been done. And people have been looking at this concept for decades. Since the early 1900s, people have been looking at rewiring nerves to, to recover specific functions in spinal cord injury. What they hadn't caught on to was some of the factors that we now know in nerve injury is the avoiding the graft if you can, making sure that you know what the recipient looks like, being able to do these distal transfers, specific donor to specific recipient within a time window. And so now we thought, why don't we go revisit this issue? So with the spinal cord injury, we separated what we call the superlesional segment, all the normal stuff still connected to the brain, the injured metamere, the guy that's been squashed and he's lost a lot of the central gray matter, so he has the equivalent of a nerve injury here because the cell bodies to those axons are lost, and so you actually lose the muscle associated. Then we have the infralesional segment, so this is essentially normal healthy spinal cord, normal healthy nerves coming off of it, but the brain can't talk to it very well because this guy in the middle. Just another graphic of the same thing, and here is, could you play that video? And here's the most important distinction for us to make for these nerve transfers is if it's the injured metamere, you turn your stimulator on and the muscles don't contract, so you have the equivalent of a nerve injury. If this were the injury, you'd want to jump on that just like you would a nerve within a year to get that rewired. And the chronic patient, that needs a, that needs a tendon transfer. And so this, this is the repair concept. Get to it early, you can go to the, to the superlesional segment, the part that's con connected to the brain, and connect that to this denervated one within a time window and you can get those muscles back. <clears throat> this scenario, which is a very common scenario, go ahead and play this one. We have a chronic spinal cord injury. You hook up your neuromuscular stimulator and everything's there. So we know we have a perfectly healthy spinal cord, perfectly healthy peripheral nerves, good muscles there. Usually you can tell that by the spasticity. And now we know that even five, 10 years after the injury, as long as we've kept the mechanics of the hand intact, we have a potential nerve transfer here that should work. So this is the concept again. You're taking the stuff that's connected to the brain, you're bypassing the injury site, and you're connecting it directly to the muscle. So imagine somebody who has great biceps or great elbow flexion connected to the brain. They can do that very well. They can't close the hand. You can rewire a por portion of that to the median nerve to get the hand to close. The retraining would be the same as what we do in peripheral nerve injury. And the regeneration in this, <clears throat> because it's an acute injury, again, healthy nerves below the injury, they've never been damaged before. The time that you do the cut and transfer, 
That's the first time these Schwann cells are seeing a loss of an axon. So they are all present. There's no degeneration or scarring. The muscle is still present there. They're multiplying and throwing out the breadcrumbs for the first time. So it's a perfect environment for peripheral nerve regeneration. So here's a scenario that we did in, in the peripheral nervous system. Again, somebody else shot. We had hand out, no finger flexion, no pronation, and rewired from the biceps down to here, and we're able to get some individual action of thumb index middle and pronation. So we got four different functions from a nerve that assists with elbow flexion. So you're realizing the brain is doing a lot of rewiring here to make all this happen. You had, this is again, it comes from the brachialis, which with the biceps and the coracobrachialis, three muscles here that help you do this. We're taking one of them and sending it into several different territories, and it's saying, okay, now we have a different function here. Let's figure it out so the brain remaps, and then we get from that nerve individual finger flexion, pronation, some of these different movements. It's not, you're not going to play the piano with this, but clearly we're accomplishing a lot more than what we were doing with tendon transfers in the past. So this is the first patient we, we did this on. We got the IRB through at Wash U, and a guy came to me with the freehand system. Folks from Cleveland will, will know about that. That was the functional electrical stimulation system where you could put the stimulators in the muscles, and there was a computer to control it, and you could get some grasp and release. Well, he decided he hated it because the control wasn't fine, and he ended up turning it off and had some pain from the wires pulling. So he came to ask me to take the system out and said, do you have anything to help me out? at this point. So we said, why? Yes, we do. You can try nerve transfers for you. So he was a typical C5. So the red stuff is the stuff that works on the left, and the gray stuff is the stuff that doesn't work. And because he had the free, free hand system, and we know that all of our targets work perfectly because you can stimulate them, and the hand closes, the hand opens, and, and so forth. So here was the operation. This is the... The musculocutaneous nerve goes to the biceps, goes to the brachialis, sends a sensory branch to the forearm. As long as you have one of these muscles intact, you're going to flex the arm pretty well. So we decided we'd take a subset of that. Um, and then we went into the median nerve. Go ahead and play that video. So then you go into the median. Again, the fun thing about the spinal cord injury is that these are healthy nerves, and so we don't have to guess or completely dissect them out all the way down to the wrist to get the right target. You can just take it apart and stimulate until you get what you want. So that, I find the fascicle that brings the thumb in, that flexes the wrist, and flexes the, the first three fingers in a way that looks very functional. All right, go ahead and play that. And this is how it works. So that was the branch to the brachialis muscle we just took, but it was only part of it. It was about two-thirds, and so that muscle still contracts and it still has innervation to it. This is the fascicle to the median nerve that we selected. So we trim them up, bring them together, and again, we have an environment that grows. We don't have to throw any special chemicals on, although I would love it if somebody come up with something even beefs up further what we do with the peripheral nervous system. But we use these little... Well, let's do it. <laughs> let's do it. All right, so that's what it looks like. We want to get finger extension. This is a different patient. So the biceps supinates or turns the palm up. We also have a muscle called the supinator, which supinates, turns the palms up. So we always want to take something that you have redundancy of. So we use the supinator muscle, and we don't lose anything. There's the nerves. Here he is. Go ahead and play that one. This is the fun we have in the operating room. So there is the nerve branch that supinates. So that's the guy I'm going to take. And then play that one. And there's the target. So he has a C6 injury. He has some radial deviation, wrist extension, no finger movement whatsoever. And then that was the transfer we did. And so go ahead and play that. So as he begins to recover, this is the rehab portion of it. We want to resist his ability to turn his palm up. And now he's able to extend his fingers.
So that's going to take some training for him to wrap his mind around that. But he now has brain connection to finger extensors, which he didn't have before. And go ahead and play that one. <clears throat> So resisting elbow flexion, and in come the fingers and the thumb. And again, there's going to be a period of retraining and learning how to use this and strengthening it and so forth. You can't come into this game passive. Move, move my nerves and make me all better. You have to be an active participant in this thing, and you've got to work with what you get. Because the people who are lazy and say, well, it just didn't really work out, are this, you know, we do the exact same operation on the guy who comes back and says, my gosh, look at my hand. It's working beautifully. It's it's really dependent on how much you push it and how hard you work to retrain that brain to learn to use the new connections. So, uh, last little piece here. Um, what about incomplete injuries? So complete injuries, it's, it's pretty straightforward. We take the stuff that works, we try to rewire the stuff that doesn't work, and uh, you know, we, we know what our priorities are. In incomplete injuries, you have this very heterogeneous activation of, of the muscles within the arm or the leg or whatever else. If you go in there, you see, you see it, just a lot of spasticity. The hand doesn't work well. It doesn't open well and so forth. But if you go in there and we put our fine wires in each of the muscles in there, you can see that there are some that the brain has control over. And there's some that won't shut up. They're just on all the time. There's some that just won't turn on because often they are the antagonist to the one that won't turn off. And so they are reciprocally inhibited. So there's this whole mess of activity in there. And the other thing that we can do with the peripheral nerves is what's called the... the Selective peripheral neurotomy. So you can actually get inside the nerve here, and using the same concept we talked about before with the motor unit, if you trim it back, you can take up to four-fifths of it again. You lose that sensory input to the spinal cord that's, that's causing it to give more output than it's supposed to, but you can recover all those muscles. So you can downgrade tone and get better function. So let me skip on through this. So you can open up the arm. You have too much pronation. Well, we have our pronator branch up here. You have too much wrist flexion. Well, he hides back there. Too much finger flexion at the first knuckle right there, which is very common. You can trim him there. And then the distal function is over here, so we know exactly what to go after and where to trim. And here's an example of that. Go ahead and play that. This young man is actually a brain injury. But he's got such substantial tone we've been coaching. Okay, I want you to close your hand and extend your wrist. Come on, go, 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 go. And as he works at it, he eventually gets some movement there, but it's pretty poor. We put him through this procedure, downgrade the tone, and go ahead and play that. And these types of procedures, I think, you know, as, as we get stem cells, these other strategies to regrow the spinal cord, we're not probably going to be creating a perfect spinal cord. We're going to be improving the situation, but we're going to have some co-contractions. We're going to have some things that aren't ideal. And so I think that there will always be a tune-up phase. Now, I'm sorry, I talked while he was playing there, but he regained the ability to extend at the wrist in a better grasp, and then we did his biceps. He couldn't reach before, and once we downgraded that, he was able to reach out in front of him, so we were able to stepwise recreate better function. We did this for a gentleman here in his leg. He had the inversion, toe pointing, had a terrible time walking. We rehabbed him for, I'll go ahead and play that video. After a number of years of rehab, this is where he was. If he had a walker, he, you know, held firmly to that and he could scoot himself across the floor. We went and did this neurotomy on the back of his leg. Whoop. Can you get me back on track? Well, the next picture is not tap dancing, but it is uh, putting down the walker and being able to walk independently. So he's not having to fight that tone and resist it and try to get his foot up as hard. The foot is falling into position much more easily for him. So, and that's about the end of the talk. So I'm going to wrap it up there. So, so peripheral nerve transfers, we're finding that they work well and there are a whole lot of targets we can go after. Um, that they, they are sort of the low hanging fruit in the spinal cord injury. One of the other ones we've been working on is recovering the bladder as Dr. Silver is, by using direct peripheral nerve transfers into the, uh, the nerve to the bladder, right on the side of the wall of the bladder there. So taking lower intercostals for a thoracolumbar injury, 
and wiring them right in there. We still have a problem with the detrusor or with the um, sphincter, but we can, in the dogs now, get those nerves to make beautiful connections and get them to actually contract and release urine. And so it won't be long before we're able to apply that in humans. Ah, go ahead and play it. Okay. So he's been able to give up his walker after about 15 years of having to use it for everything. And then once you get the arm done as well, as he gets the swing back into his arm, that establishes better balance and he'll be able to do much better independently. So th these are procedures that, again, they're stepwise done and you can take something that has plateaued in its recovery and bring it again to the next level. So I think we're at the end. Yeah, I won't go through that. Thank you very much.